Hello and welcome to Africa This Week with me, Ayo Johnson. This show looks at the affairs of Sub-Saharan Africa and the African diaspora. Today, we'll be looking at the student protest that's been taking place in South Africa. And later on the program, we'll be speaking with an award-winning filmmaker and director on Africa's representation in films. But first, on Tuesday, Uganda's army began to pull out from neighboring South Sudan in a peace deal aimed at ending nearly two years of civil war. Admin Munu has more on this and the rest of the week's headline news. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni deployed troops to South Sudan in support of President Salva Kiir, who was fighting rebels led by former Deputy President Rik Mashar. The Ugandan soldiers have played a key role in defending the capital Juba and have used helicopter gunships to fend off rebel attacks elsewhere in the country. As part of a peace deal mediated by regional bloc IGAD and signed in Addis Ababa in August by Kir and Mashar, the Ugandan soldiers were supposed to leave South Sudan earlier this month. The demilitarization of government-held Juba to allow the return of Mashar and his rebel entourage is the key provision of the peace agreement. The Ugandan soldiers are due to be replaced by a neutral force, while South Sudanese soldiers are to be relocated to barracks outside the city. Demonstrators and security forces clashed for a second day in Congo's capital on Wednesday in unrest triggered by President Ngeso's bid to extend his three-decade stay in office. This comes a day after four people were killed and ten injured, and for the second day running, mobile, internet, text messaging services and French radio RFI signal were cut throughout the city. In Paris, French President François Hollande urged his Congolese counterpart to calm tensions. And the violence prompted urgent calls for calm from a visiting senior U.S. official and Amnesty International. The first military exercise of the African Union's African Standby Force, set up to intervene quickly in conflicts and crises, got underway with a military parade. The programme, training approximately 5,400 members of the force, is intended to evaluate the readiness of the ASF to be fully operational by December 2015. The force, set up by the African Union, will be composed of five brigades derived from Africa's economic blocs, aiming to ensure the self-reliance of the region for peacekeeping and conflict resolution. Over 30,000 people in South Sudan's war zone regions face death by starvation, according to the United Nations on Thursday, who warned that tens of thousands more are on the brink of famine. While an official famine has not been declared, a report by the UN describes the worst conditions yet seen in a 22-month civil war marked by atrocities and accusations of war crimes, including the blockading of food supplies. Those worst affected are in the northern battleground state of Unity, which has seen some of the heaviest fighting, including the mass abduction and rape of women and children. Some 3.9 million people are in crisis, a massive 80 per cent rise compared to the same period last year. Officials at Red University, the University of Cape Town and the University of Witwatersrand suspended classes early this week due to the wave of protests. Thousands of students have attended rallies against the fee hikes during months of growing campus activism. However, the university heads maintain that the fees hike is necessary to provide quality education. Protesting students at the university have blockaded entrances in recent days, demanding that the proposed 10.5% fee increase for 2016 be scrapped. Oh 
South African White Police used stun grenades to disperse protesting students outside Parliament in Cape Town on Wednesday. But on Thursday, President Zuma announced that he will meet with students to find a solution. No To discuss the protests in South Africa, we have Siambonga Gole, who is an MBA student at the University of Cape Town, one of the universities shot down. We'll also be having Godfrey Major, who's a president of the student chapter of Black Management Forum. They'll focus on social economic progress in South Africa. We want to hear you, what you have to say about this on, by sending us some tweets. And of course, uh, with that and all, we'll be very welcome. Okay, guys, welcome to the show. Um, can I start off, Godfrey, uh, the situation at the moment is quite tense. Um, how important would you say that finance would be the central part of the University of, in terms of education, in terms of all these violence and, and also all the protests we've been seeing? Okay, um, thank, thank you for, for your time. If I hear you correctly, you are asking how important are finance in terms of unlocking the doors to uh, higher education. Is that correct? Absolutely. In the context of how much finance has played a part in, in getting people so wound up. So how much does it cost, generally? Well, not necessarily in the context of costing, but in terms of the, its effect as being a central forum in the, in, the, in the old saga of the discussions surrounding why students are protesting right now. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, we, we, we're speaking firstly to set the context about a society where there is huge inequality because of our history in South Africa. You should know that uh, uh, a majority of the students that go into higher education actually come from families that cannot afford not just the increments that come each and every year, but the existing fees already. So the, 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 the pricing structure and the methodology that we use in South Africa to price higher education is not proportional to the reality on the ground. It does not uh, reflect the reality that a lot of these students are coming from families that are poor. There is a problem of uh, unemployment, inequality, and poverty. And that is the context. What? So because of that, the expenses thereof become more greater on the students than in, a, for example, a country where a majority of students will come from well-off uh, families. Well, well in, on the issue of well-off families, I, I know that will play a pivotal role. I mean, there are a lot of poverty in many parts of South Africa, being such a rich and prosperous country. Yeah. But, but Sia, you, you, are, you are a student yourself, and you can feel the pulse as to what's motivating a lot of these students on the ground protesting. That We're seeing the, the, the largest protest since the apartheid movement ended in 1994. Uh, uh, we are also seeing a lot of students singing um, anti-apartheid songs um, how concerned are you? Well, I don't know if I'd say I'm concerned so much as, uh, as in fact, quite happy to see, you know, the, 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 the so-called born free generation reacting in this way. I mean, they've, they've been characterized as, uh, as, I suppose, having, not having a, a real fight uh, or, or dog in the fight as up until now, and, uh, and they now have something to, to fight for in the, in the way of these fees. So, but I guess speaking to the, the actual sort of anti-apartheid songs and, and that aspect of your question, it is worth noting that um, you know, a lot of the students at the helm of these protests were born in and around the time of the abolition of, of apartheid. So you know, their, their parents uh, you know, would have told them about what, um, you know, for instance, the ruling party represented. And they've gr grown up in a far more, I guess, pluralistic society by and large. Uh, and so the, the fact that... Um, you know, they're seeing, you know, they're coming into university now. Many of them have, have been in, in, in sort of, you know, much more sort of modern, much more mixed uh, kind of schools and that sort of thing. And now they're coming to university and they're seeing essentially for the first time, uh, you know, almost structural uh, inequalities and, 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 and institutional, um, you know, inequalities in their actual universities. And they're reacting. Essentially, they're seeing their friends, they're seeing people that they've grown up with, um, you know, being unfairly treated by a system, uh, you know, systemic issues. And they're reacting in, in, I guess, the way that they've understood that their parents would have reacted uh, back in uh, back in the day. So, um, so the, the context is, is quite interesting. The fact that you know many of these children are, in fact, what we term born free in this country. Well, um, I mean, see, uh, you're talking about elemental frustration that's driving students forward. There, uh, Godfrey, 
the, the police have already charged 29 protesters um, for so-called wrongdoing, despite the fact that these protesters marched in large numbers to the, um, uh, the African National Congress headquarters. Um, whose side is going to win this saga, and what do you think the government should do next? Okay. Uh, so th there's always a problem here, uh, in terms of the, the, the way in which police handle protests. It's not only with the students. If you have seen uh, events surrounding the Marikana uh, massacre earlier, uh, uh, you, you've seen in other community protests where our police come in and enforce the same type of uh, aggression and attitude that was shown by the previous uh, police system in South Africa. So it's an issue of a culture, really. We, we cannot... Have, totally blame the leadership. Uh, we can also blame the culture that was uh, put on to South Africans for, for, for a very long time. So police are trained to come in and, 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 and enforce uh, the, the law forcefully. Even in instances where, for example, I was in some of those uh, uh, protests, uh, basically just observing, I've visited a few of the institutions, and I've seen that they were, uh, on average, peaceful. But the manner in which police react is uh, always uh, exaggerated because of how they are, you know, oriented. That's, I think, the problem. It's an issue of culture, and we just need to teach our police, uh, you know, people in South Africa about how best to handle a protest as a form of conversation. Because protests and demonstrations are a, are a conversation. They are not... Uh, a point of uh, physical interaction or anything like that. Well, Until well, police Godfrey, can on the issue it. of, of uh, protest and the how the police in the past have, have done and dealt with protest, uh, in some times we've seen very worrying scenes of protest being uh, used and abused by police in very, very ugly ways. So I wouldn't take that with a lot of confidence as to how the South African police would react. But, um, Sia, you are a student who who's uh, lived the life, you've been in the, in, in the universities, you, you've seen exactly what students go through. Uh, what do you make of the fact that President Zuma met with some of these students? Uh, what's your reaction and how much, of, how much of a confidence booster would that be for the students on the ground who are protesting right now? So, look, I think, um, you know, I guess breaking news. Um, so the, the first of the short-term demands for a 0% increase in, uh, in the fees for 2016 has, in fact, been met. Um, you know, Zuma met with uh, today, in fact, with the vice chancellors of the various universities and some of the student leaders, and they have, in fact, announced that there's going to be a 0% increase. Uh, this has obviously been, been greeted, uh, you know, civil society, students, it's been fantastic news for them. However, more importantly, um, will obviously be the, the sort of the redress of the, the, the longer term structural issues, which, uh, which Godfrey uh, has already alluded to. But in terms of um, how Zuma uh, you know, has reacted and how students are reacting to him, or at least the ANC, it's certainly the last sort of week or two have been quite instructive in, uh, in I guess, how the classic political structures have, have been reacting to this mentality. They've, they seem to have been strangely ineffective, almost like deer caught in the headlights. And, and, I, and I speak both, in fact, I speak of the, the, the DA, I speak of AMC, and indeed the EFF. Uh, you know, at, at many of these protests, uh, they've had representatives go in to try and talk to students and essentially have been shooed away. The students say, you know, they have a very specific objective and, uh, and it's very nonpartisan and non-racial to a large degree. Well, well and, on the issue of uh, racial been... to a light degree that you've just mentioned there, I mean, how much does race have to play? I mean, South Africa is a very colorful country full of all sorts of different connotations that form up the rainbow nation itself. How much of that's being damaged right now? So, again, what we've seen, in fact, is a lot of solidarity uh, between students of all colors. There's been a, a seeming drive to try and make this, as I say, nonpartisan, but particularly non-racial. Now, obviously, uh, because of the structural issues that Godfrey mentioned, uh, you know, with 80% with of the country being black, any protest is going to uh, be, you know, overly, not overly represented, but there'll be a majority of black people. But because of the fact that uh, you know, the structural inequality in the system means that black people will be overrepresented in terms of those who are, uh, you know, sort of less to do, more destitute. Um, you know, obviously a lot more black people are affected by the things which, uh, you know, which have led to these protests. 
even still, a lot of the, the more well-to-do, those who can afford the fees, those who can afford the fee increases, have still come out in solidarity um, you know, with the protests. And I don't think it's damaged race relations as much as it's actually built them, at least for the younger generations. I can't speak for some of the older ones where there has been, uh, perhaps due to the, the media reporting, there certainly has been quite a disparity um, and, and polarization of views. Well, well on, on that level of polarization that you make reference to and, and the Rainbow Nation and it's all, it's different cultures which are all woven into one, which makes South Africa. Uh, Godfrey, uh, um, how, how firm are you and how much, how much confidence do you have that this current round of protest would soon end and the students will go back to their dorms, go back to university and start studying again? Um, if you may please repeat your question, um, I must apologize. I was actually walking from well, a very nice uh, yes. place into the car. So yes, I'm fine, Godfrey. If you could, in, in a few questions. few sentences, that the time we've got allocated, uh, can you can you sort of put it into context for us? Um, we, we we already know that the the, the students are mm. protesting. They're angry. Yes. Um, they, they, but. Is this protest going to continue, or are we going to see the students going back into their dorms, going back to university, and, and hopefully start studying again? Yes, uh, actually, as we speak, uh, uh, thank you, by the way, Sia, for sharing the breaking news. I actually got uh, to, uh, to know about the news uh, late last night. There was an intention by the ruling party to, to, to agree to the 0%. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the students are very organized. Uh, as we speak, uh, for the past week, I have visited students who were in libraries, uh, actually study at, for example, Vets University. The, some of the places where they are occupying, they are not just sitting and singing there. They have their books, they have their laptops. If you can see some of the images available in the public domain, you will see that students are actually studying for their exams. So I don't think the matches will affect them very badly except that there has not been formal lectures. So that has taken away, uh, you know, some contact time with the lecturers, uh, and that, that perhaps may affect them to an extent. Well, on, but, on that uh, basis of, of, of the fact that they've been affected by the university, the fact that the, the protesters themselves have not been studying, and, and of course, the, this has been some t element of a distraction. I, I think this saga is going to carry on, uh, and I want to thank both uh, um, Sia and Godfrey for uh, an amazing debate there. Uh, thank you so much for your comments. We'll now be moving on to discuss articles that have made this week's headlines. Joining me, we have our reporter, Anissa Omar. Anissa, it's been a long week. It has been. Um, a lot of stories. I've seen some of them. Um, which ones have really, truly made a difference? I've caught your eye. So the first story is Ghana plans to remove English as a medium of instruction in schools. So they're looking to make the uh, mother tongue the national language of Ghana. But is removing English from... Yeah the national curriculum mm -hmm. uh, and now using the mother tongue, how much is that going to be removing the colonial past uh, and all that, you know, because uh, they, they've got a rich history mm -hmm. going way back. I think that influences this decision to try and make a, an African identity. It's being pushed forward by the Minister of Education, Jane Nana, and it hasn't actually become a law as, it, as yet, but she's looking to really push forward this agenda. And she's had a very welcomed uh, reception by other ministers. So it looks like there is a quite, a, quite a strong potential that it could pass. There has been so much uh, Twitter, Twitterage, as it were, <laughs> yes. um, on social media uh, from, from both camps, saying that it's good because it's creating that, that not only the identity, but showing young people that that, that, that uh, the language of Ghana is Im important to their heritage. So the Ministry of Education already expressing that they want to go for this. Yeah. Uh, of course, this change would be very profound, very mm -hmm. different, and would literally change the entire country and how they operate. It would completely, uh, yes. Positive or negative, in your opinion? So, so the other side would be that, yeah, on a, on a practical and on a, on a global level, English is, is, is the language. So to completely remove that from the national curriculum is perhaps not a not a not a good not a good way to, to go forward for the skill set for the economy and to work with other, other nations so if, in, in my opinion it is it is a, an interesting initiative but not one that should particularly be put forward on a national scale there should be encouragement but more on the mother tongue being part of the curriculum but not the complete curriculum yes uh, and of course we, we've got a story on China 
We do. So China targets African support in Western institutions. And this article is from African Business Magazine Online. What kind of uh, support are we looking at from China again? So they're looking at um, trying to create legal, increase their legal ties with Africa. And it's, I think it's really off the back of the economic, you know, mass economic. This year, trade worth has been 300 billion from China uh, to Africa. And investment has been 50 billion. And there's been a lot of uh, you know, allegations and you know, proof that there has been many human rights violations carried out by Chinese companies. So creating that le legality whereby um, there's more transparency is what this article is trying to put forward. And, and of course, only this week we, we've mm. got the, the British government announcing that uh, the Chinese yeah. are going to be uh, pushing forward billions of dollars yeah. of investment. And we know that's happening on the African continent. Do you think China's wanting to control Africa and the rest of the world all in one? I think there is that type of uh, agenda. And there, for, for me, this article is kind of creating that narrative, as it were. There's even talks of, Afri of uh, African law being taught in Chinese universities. So they're really trying to create that bridge of not just economic ties, but an ideological t ties and trying to really legitimize their reasons for being in Africa. But this, what this article doesn't do, and it's perhaps not surprising, it doesn't say how, what are the legal ties? Issues, problems, not too late. Yep. What else do we have? So our third article is a Cote d'Ivoire Ivory Coast's uh, journey to uh, democracy and underreported good news story. So it's talking about the Ivory Coast and it's a, a great level of democracy. So why, why haven't we sort of heard good news in a wider context worldwide? We, we really haven't because it's, uh, it's the negative uh, African narrative that really does usually get the get the news coverage and a, and a positive a story like this doesn't and also because within the a wider context uh, Ivory Coast is doing great but in terms of an international level it's not something perhaps not to, to shout about and you think um, better and un unreported uh, positive stories would make a, a difference to Africa if they're pushed in this fashion? I think so. I mean, we're, we're looking at the Ivory Coast. It's got the highest rate of Im improvement in democracy uh, since 2011. Beforehand, it was under autocratic rule. Mm -hmm. And it's been doing very well on the Mo Ibrahim in Index, which is a governance index, looking not just at governance, but also different human rights aspects in Africa and it's one of the most improved countries in, in that regard. So if we kind of contextualize it and look at it from an African uh, point of view, then it's doing very well and it deserves, it deserves that, that attention. They've come a long way from Bagbo being in charge to uh, you yes. know, the new president now running the show and, and making uh, so much of a difference. What about the documentary that we have, uh, the story? So about? yes, our final article is uh, Africa's documentary that shows a positive side of Africa uh, created by a by three uh, gentlemen, directors from Sweden, who are trying to show the, the positive cultural side of Africa within a documentary that shows from s parts from Senegal, Ghana, South Africa. There's examples, for instance, there'll be musical artists, trick bikes, 3D artists. So showing the contemporary culture uh, within Africa that's not very much very much shown on the worldwide so so stage. what about elements of negativity associated with this piece uh, a lot of people are talking that. so if we get a quote from the um from the one of the directors uh, called burr he says the project started because we have our roots in east africa and growing up in sweden we didn't see any positives stories we heard about our own countries and from africa in the media were just about wars poverty and famine so he, they are really trying to create a platform, and a platform not just within this documentary, but they're also creating an Afropedia, so an African Wikipedia. In, in, in a few sentences, so you believe that Africans returning home, setting up businesses, which is what the narrative is about, do you yes. think it's a good thing or make a difference? I think it's a start. There really is a, lo a, a long way to go. And it's showing the diaspora links and showing that there is this room for creative industries within not only Africa but within the diaspora and for us to work together to get this narrative going. Anissa Omar, thank you so much. We'll be taking a short break but when we come back we will look at African representation in film. See you in a moment. <laughs>